namaste. <laughs> so astrology, <laughs> Vedic astrology, not Western astrology. Western astrology is broken. It's, it's just useless, you know. But Vedic astrology is extremely accurate and powerful. And it will tell you, well, if you know how to use it, <laughs> uh, it will tell you exactly what's going to happen in your life. You can pretty much predict the whole outline of your story. And even you can predict things like marriage, children, uh, the different phases of your life, you know, the periods of your life, the, the long phases that everybody goes through. And, of course, you can predict what's going to be the spiritual outcome. At least 90% you can predict. And it's possible by Vedic astrology, one of the most useful aspects of it is the timing of events. For example, if something happens in your life, like you get a new job or you lose your old one or you get married or whatever, you can pretty much calculate by Vedic astrology how long it's going to last. So if you get sick, for example, you can see what planet is associated with that event and then determine from that how long it's going to last. It makes it a lot easier to tolerate the changes of life if you know that they're impermanent and you have a way of predicting, you know, pretty much within a ballpark figure, how long it's going to last. It makes it a lot easier to tolerate things. So astrology is very useful. But what is astrology, actually? <laughs> it's a picture of your karma at the moment of birth. The karmic the debts and credits that you have from your previous lives. And specifically the ones that are going to affect this life. And that's called prarabdha karma or ripe karma. So the karma that's ripe, just like a fruit falls from the tree when it's ripe, the ripe karma is going to fall, it's going to happen in this life. <clears throat> so, by knowing one's astrology chart, one can predict so many things and evaluate so many things and understand so many things. So, why am I talking about the end of astrology? Huh? I mean, you know, if you've watched these videos for, for a while, I take astrology pretty seriously and I know it well enough to make pretty good predictions. But, for a person who is approaching liberation, enlightenment, freedom from rebirth, astrology becomes less and less important, less and less valuable. And why is that? Well, like I said, an astrology chart is a picture of one's karma. And then the stars and planets, as they go around, are like a clock. And just like you might put a timer on your lights or some other machine to turn on and off, the karma that you're born with is also under a timer. And when the clock of the stars and planets reaches the right time, it will turn on and become active. And again, then when the time is finished, it will become inactive. So that's why you might see so many things in your chart, but they don't happen all at once. And the way to predict when it's going to happen is by use of transits and dashas, mahadashas, and these kind of planetary periods. A planetary period, or mahadasha, is a period during which the influence of that particular planet becomes very prominent. And they range from, I think, like four years from Mercury, because Mercury travels very fast, all the way up to 27 years or 30 years, I think it is, for Saturn. Saturn moves very slowly. So 
if you're in Saturn Mahadasha <laughs> and you have a bad Saturn placement in your chart, oh, it seems like it's just going to last forever. But nothing in this life lasts forever. There's always an end to it. There's always a change. There's always a new set of conditions coming into force by the clock of the stars and planets. So, of course, this is very useful if you want to know your destiny, your fate, and the opportunities that life holds for you. So, one of the things that astrology can predict is enlightenment and spiritual advancement in general. Uh, a person's state of spiritual advancement is quite easy to know from the birth chart and also their chances for liberation, moksha. So as a person approaches liberation, what's happening actually? Well, the karma attaches to a particular body and mind. Uh, the subtle body is the carrier of this karma and it comes from the previous lives. We've spoke many times about how at the time of death, all of the previous life's experiences and impressions are rewound and compressed into a little seed. And that seed is carried by the subtle body to the next body, next gross body, and becomes the seed of that life. So a person's karma that's visible at the time of birth is basically this seed which is carried from the previous life. So what is in this seed determines one's desires, character, general nature, health, all kinds of qualities about their life, and also their chances at spiritual advancement. Now, of course, spiritual life is one of those things that isn't completely covered by karma. Our individual will has a lot to do with it, and also blessings that one may receive. So as we go through life and we experience different phases or facets of our karma, we also get all kinds of opportunities to advance spiritually. And what does that mean? Well, the influence of sadhana, and that means all kinds of the facets or aspects of sadhana, such as association with advanced spiritual people, study of the scriptures, practicing of mantras and pujas, pilgrimage, devotion, and you know all of the aspects of sadhana, meditation, and so on. These all act to dissolve the mind, the subtle body, see, the linga sharira, the subtle body, because this is where the karma resides. And if one is successful and completely surpasses and transcends the subtle body and attains the self, then what happens? The mind is, doesn't become inactive because the body is still controlled by the karma but it becomes under control. It no longer controls you. You realize that I am pure consciousness. I am not this body and mind. These are just containers. Huh? These are just shells, koshas. Okay. So when we are in a lower state of consciousness in the material world, we're subject to this karma because the karma is contained in the mind, and the mind is in control. But when through sadhana we transcend the body and mind, we actually become qualified to be a resident of the pure creation. We were talking uh, just in the previous video about the koshas, the bodies of the shakti. Uh, actually, it means more like a covering or a shell. So these shells of energy and matter, uh, in the case of a human being, are five. The gross body, the anamaya kosha, 
than the mind, manomaya kosha, the life energy, pranamaya kosha, including the chakras and kundalini and all that, and then the vijnana maya kosha, the intelligence, and finally the ananda maya kosha, pure consciousness. Well, those are the koshas of the human beings in the material world, in the gross creation or the impure creation. But then Devi or Shakti in the pure creation has six koshas, six sheaths or bodily coverings. And they, of course, again, go from subtle to gross. And the gross are the jivas, the living entities like us that are born in the material world. And we are subject to karma, but the other higher sheaths are not. So when one attains spiritual consciousness, one is in effect becoming a resident of the pure creation, the higher uh, five sheaths uh, of Devi, of Shakti. And she says that once one becomes established in this spiritual consciousness, the term she uses is one reaches Satyaloka. Satyaloka means I am consciousness. <laughs> I am not this body. So once one becomes uh, established in that realization, he doesn't take birth again. This is moksha. This is liberation, deliverance, huh? release from the karma of the material world. Because if the subtle body, if the mind is dissolved by sadhana to the point where one can transcend it, then one's karma can no longer dominate or affect him. So in other words, karma is happening to the body and mind because that's what they do. <laughs> the prarabdha karma becomes uh, very much lighter, you know, by means of sadhana. And one becomes able to resist or even ignore the effects on the mental and gross bodies. So then what happens? When this body is finished, the sanchari karma, the life, the next life's karma is already dissolved. There's no more creation of a karmic seed, and so there's no more rebirth in the material world, and one goes on to the pure creation and beyond. Uh -huh. So at that point, one ceases to be interested in astrology, except maybe for the maintenance of the body, but that's all, you know? It's good to know if how one's health is going to be, and you know, financial situation and stuff like that. But it, it's not important anymore. You know, it's about as important as what am I going to buy at the store today? <laughs> you know, it's just little routine maintenance stuff. It's not, not really a big deal. Even including death. The death of this body is actually to be celebrated when one attains liberation, because it means the end of all the karma, completely, forever, finished, done. And one experiences being settled or established in the pure creation before the death of this body. And this is called Jivan Mukta. In other words, his liberation is assured his transcendence is already a done deal. He's got his ticket. <laughs> and he's just waiting for the prarabdha karma of this body to be finished. And then that's it. So you might ask, well, why did God make it so that even if you attain liberation, that you still have to suffer the body's prarabdha karma? And the answer is because then these people become holy teachers. They have the point of view uh, of the state of liberation. It's not book learning. It's not theoretical. It's direct and practical 
and absolutely real to them. They already know where they're going in the next life uh, because that's actually where they live and they come here as visitors, you know, <laughs> just to show a good example and spread the knowledge of how to attain that highest liberation. Aung Tatsa, Aung Shakti Aung.